at some point, if prices start going down, I think the central banks are almost forced to step in again and start buying and loading up and supporting the, the asset markets. Welcome back to Metals and Miners. I'm its founder and its host, Gary Bohm. We have a fantastic discussion lined up today, and I'm just so excited about it. Inflation is becoming more entrenched and more of a problem, yet the Fed seems unable to raise rates further and is talking about cutting rates sometime this year. This kind of feels like a 1970s part two. Gold has exceeded all-time highs and appears to now be using the 2000 level or even 2200 level as support. Silver feels like it's setting up for one of those historic moves higher, and it seems like the stars are aligning for gold, silver, and the miners to be maybe setting up for a huge once-in-a-generation rally. To discuss all of this and more, we're fortunate to have with us Bob Coleman, founder of Profits Plus Capital Management and Idaho Armored Vaults. Bob has been in the investment management industry since 1992. He founded Profits Plus Capital Management in 2001 to provide intelligent research, consulting, and portfolio management services to high net worth investors and institutions. Founded in 2008, Idaho Armored Vaults has become a global leader in protecting financial assets and private property outside the financial system from risks, including systemic and counterparty threats. Moreover, for accredited investors and institutions that are seeking a professionally managed approach to precious metals, the Dollars and Cents Growth Fund, LP, managed by his capital management fund, holds 99% of the assets in physical gold and silver, employing strategies to maximize client value. I'm very much looking forward to this discussion today. Bob, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Gary, for having me. So I want to set the stage for today's discussion with a few questions about inflation, the Fed, and the markets. So, Bob, in light of recent inflation data and the ongoing fight that the Fed is having, do you see inflation as entrenched and something that may end up looking more like the 1940s and 1970s, where we experience multiple waves, or do you see it more like something that the Fed is actually going to whip? Unfortunately, the, the system is structurally set up for inflation or it's it's almost uh tied at the hip um because of all the debts um uh and and the servicing of those debts you almost need to to inflate or die uh, th that's sort of the an old adage but it's very true when it comes to fiat currencies is that the only true way the the, the currency can can kind of breathe is by expanding you know it, it you know, once you get into that debt spiral to the downside uh, that's very difficult you know to, to pull away from and so it's just easier and sort of the you know they always say the path of least resistance is simply to print more money or inflate it away and that's basically all we have i mean there's no other way to manage you know when you're spending a trillion dollars in 100 days i mean it's those are big numbers yeah yeah so let's talk about the dollar um as it relates to what you just said the u.s dollar has been strong actually you know relatively speaking for quite some time with the incredible debt and deficit levels and the pressure that the strong dollar has exerted all around the world do you see the dollar remaining strong indefinitely or are you in the camp of say Stanley Druckenmiller and do you see a weakening US dollar coming and and why? Yeah, I I, I tend to see a, a weaker dollar um and it's it's not that you know I'm a bearish on the US per se it's just that you have to look at the spending and the 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 politics of especially as an election year um you know what politicians are going to do they're not going to pull back the reins right in the middle of an election year they're they're just going to hit the put the pedal to the metal and they're just going to keep you know spending away and that's what you're seeing obviously with these emergency measures to try and avoid government shutdowns and so forth mm -hmm. and and yeah it's not that the us is the only one's doing it everybody's doing it um it's just that the the so-called you know the way we've been spending the money 
makes the economy appear stronger than I think it actually is. I mean, when you throw a trillion dollars into the economy, you're going to get economic growth. There's no way around it. It's just the question is, is that that shot of adrenaline just going to wear off just as fast as it was a, 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 a sort of applied? Or is it, it does it actually spur other types of growth? Uh, within the economy, that's the unfortunate thing. Is that you know the, the spending uh, projects and so forth, these infrastructure projects, they're really publicly funded type operations. And where you have the private, I think the private economy, um, I think is seeing slowdowns and suffering, and and some of the the concerns and questions, especially amongst small business owners, things like that. So you kind of have a bifurcated type of economy right now. Yeah, and you know. It's kind of like a great illusion as they're pumping all this money. And I think people are, many people are thinking that this is exactly the way the economy really is. But what happens when they pull the money back or they just stop pumping this money in periodically, these trillions? You know, I think there was a $1.2 trillion bill that just passed the House recently. I'm not sure that it's been signed yet. But, you know, what happens when these trillion dollar plus bills stop getting signed into law? and these bills are not getting pumped what happens then to the economy well that's that's where you get into a question of um you know asset prices start to decline collateralization of those of of all this leverage starts to implode and and it's you have to remember the the spending and so forth is not just holding up asset prices it's holding up the collateral values you know the commercial real estate the you know, so, you know, allowing the banks not to write down those assets maybe right now because they have gains in other areas. You know, it's, 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 you know, we kind of looked at it, um, put out a uh, post yesterday on Twitter about, uh, the central banks and their relationship with gold and using gold as a revaluation account to offset, um, uh, you know, unrealized losses with realized gains on the gold side to kind of help balance their, their, or make their balance sheet maybe healthier. Uh, appear healthier well it's the same thing with you know the fiscal situation i mean when you're spending this much money you're trying to maintain you know not just asset prices but also tax revenue receipts i mean there's so much tied uh to this game yeah so i i want to get into that um that twitter post that you made about the gold revaluation accounts but we're going to do that in a few minutes um but you know we're talking about this debt the, the US Treasury has these periodic auctions to sell its massive and escalating debt lately the auctions have not been very good as they have not been able to offload a significant and growing portion of the debt issuance that they need to sell bob what impact do you see this having moving forward um it, that'll probably start to take place i think after tax season you know you have a uh, you have a seasonal uh, issue right now with tax receipts actually get, getting ready to come in, you know, between March 15th and April 15th, uh, April 18th, whatever it may be. You know, this is when people wait to the last minute to pay their taxes. Um, and so that, that brings a lot of cash into the treasury. You tend to see T, uh, T bill pay downs, uh, uh, which actually gives you a lift into the markets. Uh, it actually artificially drives liquidity into the markets temporarily and then you typically get a rally and then into may that's when things usually tend to to, to kind of peak out and that's where this old adage sell in may and go away uh kind of comes into play because um after may from a fiscal standpoint the treasury starts spending money again and then they typically go into debt and they start issuing more debt and that debt becomes sort of a sponge on the financial markets yeah so um, foreign nations have been net sellers of treasuries the last decade or so. That seemed to be accelerating last year as nations needed to sell their treasuries to raise dollars to buy oil. And this came at a time that our deficits were just absolutely blowing out. Do you see a situation where the Fed and the government has worked out an arrangement with foreign nations essentially saying, it's okay that you buy oil in your own currencies and not the U.S. dollar anymore and settle the excesses in gold as long as you don't buy long-term debt of the other nations, all so that they could stop the selling of the U.S. treasuries in order to stabilize the market. And if you do see it that way, what does that mean for gold moving forward? Well, from a gold standpoint, I try to keep it maybe simpler than that. Um, 
you have to look at the balance of payments. You have to look at the counterparty risk. Uh, you have to look at their actual balance sheet. You have to look at the country's own inflation rates and what their own currencies are doing. You know, the, the, the BRICS, you know, a lot of people have made a lot of the BRICS nations sort of kind of uh, grouping together and creating, you know, something that's going to sort of compete with the dollar. I, yeah, I don't really see that happening because a lot of these BRICS nations don't even trust each other. Um, I mean, you have the Himalayan watershed you know, between India and China, and they're building up bases on top of mountains. I mean, right. you know, so I, yeah, you, you can't just – it's easy to get these – it's nice to get these headlines, and a lot of these gold promoters will you know, throw out you know, one-liners and phrases and things like that. But you know, at the end of the day – you know, you have to look. It, this is a global story with gold market. It's not necessarily just pinned on one type of, you know, whether central banks are buying or selling treasuries. Um, it, it's really a uh, situation where th every country is trying to manage their own servicing of their own debts. Um, and 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 at the same time, you know, the, the real issue is what happens if these economies start to go down? Well, naturally, if the economies start to go down, you may not need as many dollars out there, uh, uh, you know, as a central bank um, expecting, you know, because you don't have to come up with dollars to to provide, uh, uh, you know, to settle uh, transactions globally, for example, um, or trade with the U.S., um, and so that's something that these central banks are maybe also expecting is maybe at some point we're going to get a slowdown in the economy and you just won't need that that amount of dollars. And, and at that point, you know, maybe we do have more friction uh, politically uh, in the world, because typically when you have a, a real slowdown in the economy, um, that tends to bring conflict. It tends to bring um, friction and, 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 you know, it's easy to blame you know, a country or organization or, uh, you know, or, or an event for that matter to kind of take attention away from the economy and what created this mess in the first place. Yeah. A scapegoat, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. So Bob, the Fed has been deflating their balance sheet through QT for almost two years now. Do you expect them to reflate at some point soon? And if so, why, and what will be the impact in your estimation on gold, silver, and the miners? Well, it, it, oddly enough, Janet Yellen and the Treasury has been doing a tremendous job of monetary policy from their perspective. You know, traditionally they're fiscally driven, not necessarily on the monetary side. So, but you know, by them interceding into the markets, into the Treasury market, using T bills and, and so forth as a shortening up debt debt maturities it's allowing the system to kind of inflate itself because it's easier for people to take t bills and borrow against those t bills at you know 90 cents 97 cents on the dollar um yeah because it's those t bills will constantly come due so it's it's easier counterparty collateral um but but the problem with that though is it it front loads a lot of the debt so then it becomes an interesting you know Manage market, I would say, where if you can keep the front end of the curve low, you're reducing debt servicing costs. At the same time, you're at the, you know you're allowing this collateral to kind of create more buying power uh, in the marketplace, and and that's what we've been seeing. The problem is that how sustainable is it? Because as you get bigger and bigger, you need to borrow more and more to get that same rate of return. Um, and at some point, the law of law of large numbers comes into play and then you you just you get to so, to a point where it's just completely unsustainable yeah so we've seen you know on the debt issuance um i'm not debt issuance on the on the debt payment side we've seen that number skyrocket over the last 12 18 months and um it's it it's crowding out other expenses and it's causing deficits to absolutely explode so like you're saying you know how sustainable is it in your in your mind? How long can that go on for? Well, that that's the problem you run into is that as the spending flows through the economy, everybody loves inflation at the beginning because as the prices go up, everyone feels wealthier. You have the wealth effect. You spend more money. The problem you run into is that spending keeps coming. It it starts to increase the cost of living, 
and that that cost of living is really where the middle class really start feeling the pain. And you know, you're not going to see uh, you know, riots and protests right now because everyone's 401k is at you know all time highs. You know, Bitcoin's going through the roof. You know, all technology stocks are you know trillion dollar companies right now. Uh, yeah. So so and and I think the government kind of knows all this. You know, they're not dumb. You know, Tr Jan Yellen's a very smart woman. Yeah, you know, they can they can run the markets, especially in an election year, to create this wealth effect, to create this feeling of prosperity. So mm -hmm. people aren't uh, uh, mad at the polls. You know, the, the old ad is you vote with your pocketbook. Um, and I think that's what's been going on here. You know, it's just, it's just this, you know, whether you call it a melt up or you call it something else, you know, they're, they're, they're driving prices higher by the spending that they're doing fiscally. And that's, and that's something that I think a lot of bears weren't really counting on um, mm -hmm. uh, is the ability to get away with it, I guess. Uh, but, you know, it's it's one of those things where, um, you know, being in the markets for 30 years, I've seen a lot. You, 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 you almost have to allow the market to kind of get into that manic phase uh, where it gets really crazy, um, you know, going through 99, 2000. You know, seeing the internet stocks back then, you, you kind of let the market, you know, get to a point where you're blowing out all the shorts. You know, you're seeing unsustainable moves. I mean, they're 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 headline type moves. Um, and and then at that point, at some point, you know, the rip cord is going to get pulled, and you know, not knowing what that could be, you know, that's what starts you know the pullback. And the question is how strong will that pullback be? Will it cascade? Well, you know, with all this leverage that builds it up. Uh, especially with the Fed not really, you know, with it, with them reducing their balance sheet, a lot of this liquidity that's been created has been private debt creation and 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 uh, private collateralization, that type of thing. That's what's dangerous. Well, so you kind of just walked right into my next question: was do you see the markets in a new long-term bull phase or more of a blow-off top? And if the latter, if it is a blow-off top. Do you see the markets then, you know, reversing and cratering at some point in 2024 and 25? And if that's the case, how, you know, how low can it go? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the sixty four thousand dollar question. Um, I, I think um, the election, you can make a, a very strong argument that the election, it, the, the, the market's going to stay elevated into the election. Um, yeah, typically that's what happens during an election year. The the problem is after that election's over, um, you know, you you tend to get you know whatever the party is, you know, then you get the after effect or the hangover. And 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 I think that's where I think 2025 was going to be probably a very sour year in the markets. Um, you see a lot of these, you know, you look at the 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 liquidity effect, um, you know, and some of the cycle work that uh, some some of the guys do on social media and i think 2025 is going to be a very difficult year from a liquidity perspective i think inflation is is going to uh also force the hand uh, where you know maybe um you know this tightening or this loosening cycle that we're all expecting uh uh maybe you know the 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 fear is if this thing just continues to go up and up and up uh that the 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 tight or the loosening cycle may not be as big as everyone thought um, and you know what happens if the Fed starts raising rates? I mean, or you know, I mean, you just don't know. I mean, or you, what happens if you have an event, a political event, or some type of geopolitical event that that happens as well? There's a lot of, you know, you, there's a lot of things that are out there that could be the boogeyman. But but um, you know, just naturally speaking, you know, to see this sustainability of some of these moves in the stock market, um, yeah, I've seen this before. It's it ends in tears typically. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I want to ask you a question on banking. Last year, the U.S. obviously had several banks fail and the Fed came to the rescue before it had massive cascading effects. Do you see additional risks in the banking sector right now? And if so, when do you see them erupting? Well, it's interesting. You know, obviously, commercial real estate is 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 the topic du jour. I mean, that's and that's not just the U.S. That's Europe, uh, and that's you know a lot globally. Um, and and that's something that hasn't really been written off yet. A lot of this stuff hasn't been marked to market. 
what's interesting is this uh, ISDA, which is the institute uh, that oversees the derivatives market. I don't know if you if you look at the, the if you remember the the movie The Big Short. You know they they went into uh, wanting to get an ISDA um, be basically a seat at the table of the big boys. Well, that's you know that allows you to do options and a lot of these derivatives on a massive leverage scale. Well, this institute basically put out a letter to the Federal Reserve, to the Office of Control of Currency, and to one of the other banking regulators, asking for this reduction of the um, allowing banks to buy treasuries again, and instead of temporarily uh, not apl applying those treasury purchases to their leverage ratios. It permanently removing that that restriction so they so that banks could start buying treasuries at nauseum uh, without increasing their leverage ratios and what that's doing is it's centralizing assets and it's cannibalizing banks from maybe lending into the economy to instead listen we got to support the government and we got to buy the, their treasuries and and that's a dangerous thing because what happens is these banks start to get intertwined now more and more with their underlying securities that they're holding which are treasuries and that creates a big systemic risk type of issue because if one goes down or the other goes down uh or interest rates go up it it, it you're you're seeing basically all the eggs put in one basket so to speak and that's that's something that i think could become an issue down the road because there really isn't any more capital out there unless the central banks just start printing money again, which that's why I think is ultimately going to have to happen is if you keep having all the spending, there's not enough capital to keep buying trillions of dollars of, of extra uh, uh, of notes and bonds and, and, and bills and so forth. So that's, I think that's why they come out with, with this, this uh, recommendation. Um, but beyond that, uh, you know, at some point, if prices start going down, I think the central banks are almost forced to step in again and start buying and loading up and supporting the, the asset markets. Yeah, and that's what they've done. I mean, th the thought of them allowing it to go down and they do nothing and just sit idle uh, just doesn't seem realistic. Yeah, it, and and sometimes th that does happen. I mean, sometimes the, you know, the, the, you know, they want the market – you know they want to remove froth and speculation from the market, so they will take a step back and not not interact with the market or, or come in and step in and try to support the markets, and that can become dangerous. I mean, we saw that in 2008 when the Fed walked away from Lehman Brothers and you know let them go under. I mean, it 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 can have a cascading effect really fast. Yeah. All right. So with all of that as our backdrop, let's transition over to gold, Bob. In addition to central bank buying. Chinese and Indian demand for gold has been high, while Western demand has really been a net negative. They've been selling. Um, what will be the catalyst to bring Western investors back to gold? And when they do come to that table, will, will there be enough physical to handle the aggregate demand between the central banks, the Eastern buyers, and now the Western buyers? Yeah, I, th I think um, to separate the, uh, the, the investor class, um, you know the eastern buyer, the, the the central banks, the the Chinese, the Indians, they've been very steadily buying and buying heavily uh, the metals, and 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 for their own reasons. I mean, China obviously with the real estate market and the stock market, you really kind of uh, the public's feeling like, okay, I got to put my money somewhere, and I'm worried about you know a, a you know wand devaluation, whatever it may be. Um, they're 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 pushing that money into the metals, for example. Um, institutionally, um, I think you're still seeing high net worth investors and institutions interested in the markets uh, and the Western side. Maybe not as, they're certainly not, there's been, you know, with the stock market going up to new all-time highs and Bitcoin going through the roof and all that kind of stuff, you're seeing attention driven away from the metals at the moment to ask other asset classes. And that's fairly, that's very typical, very normal. The retail investor in the Western, in the Western world is I think just completely worn out. I think we saw that you know, into last year, you know, halfway through last year, you started to see things drop off by the, by toward the end of last year, uh, people were disenchanted. You started to see the selling pick up. Uh, and now you're seeing dealers very heavily uh, uh, situated with inventory, just uh, uh, you know, just 
their carrying costs are, are becoming uh, very expensive. Um, you know, they're hedging their, their inventory. So therefore, if the prices go up, you know, their hedges start going down in value, even though their underlying inventory goes up. But when those hedges go down in value, you get a margin call. You have to pony up more money to maintain those hedges. And that puts more pressure on balance sheets as well. So, so there's a lot going on here that the retail dealer industry, I think, is in some trouble. Um, now, what, 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 I, what I think is going to happen here, and I've, I've said this since the Silver Symposium last fall, was as the market rallies and goes higher, you're going to see the public – not believe the rally because we've all been watching this thing get hit on a head every time it, it pokes its head above the water is I think people are just disenchanted and they're selling into the rally, you know, hoping with the idea that they could just buy back on the next crash. Um, yeah. And I think the, the, the worry is that there isn't going to be another big pullback that you know, this thing's going to walk up this wall of worry. And, and, and I've been kind of showing this on, on, uh, my Twitter profile, um, the 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 idea of you know whether it's the CTAs, the commodity trading advisors, heavily short the market in, at the end of February, uh, or if it's the short selling that we've been seeing in SLV recently, as the market's rallying, you're you're seeing the ETF market um, almost you know divergences all over the place with mm -hmm. regard to the prices going up and and flows going down uh, and some of that is probably due to again other asset markets and this rotation uh you know all these things move in cycles so it's not that we're going to have a permanent you know gold the etf market's never going to go up again or see inflows i think it will but i you know, the problem is the western investor tends to chase price and 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 once they become sort of committed that okay I missed the move. It's not going to pull back. I just got to be in it. And then they start chasing. I think that's ultimately what's going to run the markets much higher. But that, but you're going to have to get to that point of pain where institutions and retail investors start to say, okay, I'm, I'm, I got to get back in. And, and and oddly enough, the gold market, which has broken out, I think the gold market's gotten really quiet. Um, from an industry perspective, the silver market, I think, still has a lot of promise. And I think that's where it's the it's the underdog or it's the the dark horse, so to speak, um, that I think can actually have a very strong move here. Uh, it, there's a lot of catch up that silver can play. And I think that's where you know, if you look at the gold silver ratio or you look at you look at the cost of mining I mean, there's a lot of different types of, you know, so there's uh, research firms that talk about supply deficits and that type of thing. There's a lot of underlying fundamentals that are supportive to the silver market at a time when most people are actually very pessimistic. So from a contrarian standpoint, that's the setup you want to see. So, yeah, so there's a lot of pieces in that the latter part of your answer there regarding silver that we're going to definitely touch on. I want to stick on gold for just a little while longer. You had mentioned earlier about the gold revaluation account. Um, could central bank buying of gold be due to marking up their portfolio? They they have this gold revaluation account. Can you speak into this in a little bit more depth than you did earlier and what you likely see happening with this gold revaluation account? I've heard some people say that um, there is going to be a revaluation of gold at some point in the future to help balance sheets. What are your thoughts here? Well, it, it's not necessarily this idea that Central banks are just going to flip a switch and say, "Okay, gold's now at thirty-five hundred dollars an ounce." I mean, they certainly could bid the market up to that point, and then they can, what they call, trap it or keep it sandwiched, you know, in a basically hundred-dollar range, so to speak. So it trades at a very tight range, so they support the markets, and they do that for a reason to inflate not only their balance sheet but also an attempt to fight deflation or that deflationary type of crash um, where asset prices start to spiral downward. So it's a way to kind of give a little bit of support to uh, the asset market by doing it through gold. Um, that's what that's. And I think there's revaluation account is more about accounting than it is about just simply, uh, you know, running the price up to whatever dollar amount they want to run up to. I think it's more about how to manage their balance sheet um, and make their balance sheet appear as healthy as possible. 
I see. So, Bob, there's an old saying that the wider the base, the higher in space. What do you see happening with the gold price due to the wide basing over the last four years now that it's broken out of that base? It's it, it's exciting to watch uh, from a standpoint of um, you're seeing gold come back into the monetary system and it, it, it in a time when people are in complete disbelief of it. I mean, the the digital age has sort of garnered a lot of the attention. And it, what I think if it wasn't for the Bitcoin ETFs, I think you would have seen uh, you know, just the idea that gold's breaking above 2000 and not breaking back below it. And it was holding above it. And now it's it's taking off. It's amazing how quiet this rally have, has been. Honestly, mm -hmm. um, and 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 that's that's what you want to see. It's this you, you don't want to see gold on the headlines, you know, the top ten searches or top five searches on mm -hmm. on the internet. I mean, you want to see this thing sort of do what it does behind the scenes, crawl, you know, yeah, you know, just yeah, you know, this just climb this wall of worry without you know drawing too much attention. Um, and I think that's what central banks are wanting too. I think there's because central banks you know have quite a bit of gold that they hold on their balance sheet. I mean and governments as well. So there's there is a there is a sort of win win here for for governments um, to strengthen their balance sheet uh, against you know maybe a lot of the derivatives or a lot of the the, the other currencies that they may hold or the other bonds or, or debt that they hold of other, whether it be other countries or, or if you're within the European Union, with, with the, within the members of that union. So gold is kind of reappearing again in, in the monetary system in a way that you know, you're not seeing, especially in the US, you know, mainstream investors even realizing it. That's amazing. So yeah, so it, this was mentioned earlier, but clearly Western investors, pension funds, hedge funds, They've been shunning gold. So who's on the wrong side of this trade here? The Western investors, hedge funds, pension funds who are shunning it or.